Hi everyone, I'm looking forward to seeing you in five minutes time. Please make sure you go and grab yourself a cup of tea, head to the loo so that you're ready and prepped for our five minute start time. See you soon.
Good evening and hello everybody and welcome to our second community workshop. For those that were here last night and you saw the human rights workshop. I'm sorry, I'll take a step back and do that again. First of all, my name is Sherry Beaver. The project coordinator here at Deaf Victoria for our information linkage capacity projects. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to our second committee workshop about self-advocacy and the deaf community. Before we commence, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land our respects to them. This is where we live, breathe and work. And these are the lands I walk on, the lands of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, present, past and emerging, who look after and have looked after these lands for thousands of years. The second acknowledgement is to the deaf community. We acknowledge deaf people from all around the country who have led the community, who have preserved our rich language and transmitted our culture and history down through the generations and fought for our rights. Our work would not be possible today without the leadership, contributions and development of all the previous community leaders. So we pay our respects to them. This workshop would not be present possible tonight without the support of the National Disability Insurance Scheme through their, in, through their ILC funding, Information Linkage and Capacity Building Grants. Tonight, Deaf Victoria has two different presentations. We have our presentation for the board of directors and staff which is taking place throughout these months. And the second focused upon the deaf community to build confidence, knowledge, awareness about our rights. This workshop last night and tonight is a part of the second part of this project. So with that, I'd like to also thank Expression Australia for allowing us to use the John Michael Lovett Centre, the JML Centre here in East Melbourne. With coronavirus restrictions in place, we're socially distancing in our workplace, 1.5 metres away from each other, wearing masks and following good hand hygiene and sanitizer. I now hand over to Kate Catherine Dunn, who will talk to you about the Q&A session and facilitate tonight. Kate. So, as you heard, we're really pleased that all all of you are joining us tonight. We're thrilled for you to be joining us via Zoom and Facebook. There were lots of questions last night. It was a really engaging presentation. If you want to ask a question tonight, there's a few options. Please note that you can send a question to us uh, on 0431 476 721 and send a question either in Auslan on a video or a text message in English. It's your choice. If you're watching us on Facebook tonight, you can put a comment in there and we'll follow you up and we'll take your question and we'll ask Mel to answer it later. If you want to join us tonight on Zoom, you're asking questions there, just look down at the bottom, you'll see the Q&A tab, just hit that tab and pose your question in there. If you're joining us on Zoom and you want to ask a question in Auslan, please type, I'd like to ask a question in Auslan and then we'll contact you and then we'll spotlight you so you can turn your camera on and ask your question. Please don't hold back to the end of the session and it may miss your opportunity. Please fire your questions throughout the session and we'll be monitoring those and make sure we get through them. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Melissa Hale now. And I wish everyone a good evening and enjoy great deal of Melissa's information and presentation tonight. Over 
over to you now. now. Thank you, Kate, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Hale, and I'm the coordinator of the Disability Advocacy Resource Unit. It's also known as DARU. What does DARU do? In short, we look after 24 different disability advocacy organisations throughout Victoria, including Deaf Victoria. We provide training in the area of advocacy and education, changes in the law and policy. We show a whole range of different techniques and strategies, including professional development. Tonight, I'm just going to give you a, a brief insight into what is advocacy. The objective is to help you better understand advocacy so you can better self-advocate. Now tonight, this is really going to be giving you information and examples, okay? So it's not as though it's gospel truth, right? And they're not all specific situations uh, related to only areas, particular areas. I really want you to be able to take the gist of it and be able to apply it to your own circumstances. Can we just go back one slide, thanks. So what is advocacy? Advocacy is acting, speaking, or writing to promote, protect, and defend your rights. So, in other words, if you have a problem, you need to take some action to solve it. That's advocacy. Advocacy is a, has a focus upon solutions. Advocacy doesn't mean, here's the problem, highlighting it, or being angry and unleashing or dumping. No. I'll give you an example of what I'm saying. If I'm angry, for example, let's say the quality of capturing on the television is not very good, I'm really angry, I'm going to vent on Facebook. That's not advocacy, right? Yes, you're highlighting the problem. You're telling the wider community about uh, lack of quality of captioning, but there's nothing that's going to happen or follow from it. Okay? It's just noise. You know, I'm also angered when I don't have good quality captioning to access television. But do you know what? You need to know where to make a complaint. It could be one of the television broadcasters. It could be going onto their Facebook page, or sending an email. But three things I want to share with you. One, explain the problem. Two, explain the impact on you or other people in the deaf community. And three, provide a solution. Okay? That's effective advocacy. Why? Because you're highlighting a problem and you're focusing on a solution. People think the word complaint is a bad word, but it has negative connotations. Com a complaint or complaining is not a bad word. It's a good word. It's a good thing. If you know how to complain well, you make change happen through your complaint. If no one ever made a complaint, because everyone was worried about offending other people's feelings or walking on eggshells or being called a, a continual complainer. Do you know what? Nothing would change in life. Complaining, complaints help business, help government to understand what they need to do, the right thing for their customers or clients or citizens. Do you know what? Often organizations don't know you have a barrier or an issue. What's important though is not only to present the issue of a problem, but also a potential solution. I'll give you another good example of advocacy. I was then interpreting on our emergency broadcasts. You know, with the coronavirus and the emergency announcements via our state or federal government, many uh, of those now have Auslan interpreters, if not all of them. And a lot of information you'll see there, they talk about the problem, the impact on the deaf community, and then a solution. And they get that, and that's why now They've agreed for all emergency announcements to be Auslan interpreted. There was a lot of work to get that to happen. It wasn't just one complaint, it was a series of many hours of meetings. But you brought about effective change. Now I'm going to talk about different types of advocacy. I'm going to focus on four different types of advocacy tonight individual advocacy. So when you have a problem yourself, you're trying to work through something, and you're coming up against a brick wall, you may want to bring in a professional advocate to assist you. A person's trained to be able to deal 
a particular problem. You could get an individual advocate from Deaf Victoria. That's free of charge. Catherine Dunn, Kate, who spoke earlier this evening, is an individual advocate. She can assist you. Daru helps people like Kate who train them, provide information, demonstrate strategies in practical ways so they become more effective advocates. It can be any issue, any law. It can be related to the NDIS, education, employment, access to the community, access to sport, access to any sphere in life. If you're unsure, the best thing is to always ask. Now, I'm going to give you an example of how to use a professional self-advocate, if you like. Let's say you're trying to get the right NDS plan and package for your needs, but the local area corner says, no, you've tried your very best, you're frustrated, you're beside yourself, you're at your wit's end. You may benefit from having a professional advocate with you. Do you know why? That person's objective, they're not emotionally invested in your life, they're not dealing with your frustrations, your stress. The person will listen to you, identify the issues, and assist you get what you want. They could also share some information to you. Uh, they could assist you through advocacy, representation at meeting, and also written communication. Now, the second type of advocacy I'm going to talk about tonight is self-advocacy. So self-advocacy is when I myself am responsible for myself. So I do all the research, do all the legwork, I learn how to become an advocate. I may do this work in a group with other people. I may research particular issues, different options about how to make a complaint. I do all that work on my own steam. The different types of self-advocacy groups in Victoria you may or may not be aware of. All of these groups um, are disability focused. Some of them may be um, the same type of issue or cause focused. Now, the third type of advocacy I'm going to talk about tonight is peer advocacy. That's a new growing area. We're seeing growth in this, in this area of peer advocacy. Now, this could be a person with a disability or a similar problem in this group. One person has advocated uh, about a particular problem they had, and that person as a peer then leads, educates, guides others. So it's peer-to-peer -peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer advocacy. So there are others in the group who have the same issue, that could be similar disability uh, type or similar cause type, are able to have the same outcome. And finally, systemic advocacy. So that's when you or a group want to make change to a system, a policy or a law that benefits everyone. For example, compulsory masks coronavirus. You want to change to that to allow the mask to be taken down to assist with lip reading or other forms of communication. That's a policy change. That just is not something that one individual wants, but many people who are deaf want it. And that's a different process. But all of these four different forms of advocacy being different are all equally important depending on the reason that one of them will be employed. And now I want to talk about advocating for yourself and a few things you need to think about when you embark upon doing that. So when you start advocating, you need to work out, first of all, what the real problem is. You think, Melissa, come on, that's a simple question. Do you know what? Often when I talk to people, and I myself, you know, emotions can get involved, they can start to cloud or impact your thinking. We have feelings of anger and frustration, rage, after a long period of time that have built up. We really need to just let things settle. Focus upon what the real problem is. Strip away all the emotion, all the other personality stuff around that. What, there are five things that you really need to focus upon. What is it that you want? Who can give that to you? What do they need to know? Who do they need to hear from? And how do they need to hear it? Okay, next slide. Now, I'm going to show you an example. Remember, these are just examples, okay? It's not gospel truth. Okay, in real life, it, things are a lot more complicated. So this is a simple example. Let's say you're going to the hospital, and you present at the hospital. You've asked for an Aussie interpreter, and they've declined your request, okay? And this may be a series of ongoing appointments. Now, I 
to advocate for myself. I've got to go through those five steps. Remember what those five steps are? What do I want? I want to make sure that Nozan interpreters are available for all of my appointments. And the two who can give that to me, I need to research that. Okay, when I asked, they said no. So who can give that to me? Who can provide the Ozan interpreter? Three. Who can make the change? And in my research, I might find out that the receptionist staff, they're the responsible officer in the hospital to book interpreters for patients. I'll also re research the hospital's policy and the Charter of Healthcare Rights. And most hospital, hospitals have an interpreting service, interpreting booking office. They'll have a patient advocate or a social worker who's also available to assist you, the patient, get what you need. In this case, an OSAN interpreter. There are staff at the hospital there to help you. Next slide. Now the third point, what do they need to know? So when you're thinking about this third step, think about the impact. Focus upon the impact. No, in, no interpreter, how does that impact you understanding your health care, getting your health care options, the risks to the medical professionals, doctors and other health professionals, the impact on the hospital, their risk, their liability. Include that in your letter of complaint or your email. Risk is a major issue. Tell your story. Life stories, but importantly, provide a solution to that to illustrate the impact and what you want moving forward. Next slide. Okay, who do we need to hear from? You. It's your story. It has a very powerful impact. You need to share your story with people who are in charge to make the change happen. It's those people that can change your situation, your circumstance, to ensure you have an OSAN interpreter in each of your appointments. You need to also make sure that your complaint is shared to the, the responsible and relevant officers. And fifthly, how do you tell them? I have a rule of thumb, and that is always put it in writing, an email or a letter, so you can track it later. So send the complaint through to the right people. So to sum up, you can now see when there's an issue. It's really important, first of all, to wait. Okay, let the emotion subside, the emotional reaction. Focus upon what the real issue is. There's five steps, five questions to guide your decision making. Next slide. Thanks, Philip. Another example that I would like to give is related to public speaking and talking in relation to education. Uh, for example, uh, one of the issues might be you have a deaf child who's unable to access online learning uh, for a specific reason, there's a barrier there. So before I actually start my advocacy work, um, it's very important because it can be complex and it's very difficult. Uh, there are a lot of issues involved in that scenario. Um, if you're lucky, you'll have an easy time, but it really depends on how flexible your school uh, choice is. Many uh, of the disability advocates um, face many barriers within this space. Uh, education cases can be quite difficult to manage. For example, uh, how you actually uh, use self-advocacy and those five steps to provide assistance within the education space is important to know. So first of all, remember the question is, what do you want? You need to ensure, obviously, that the child has an interpreter uh, and has access to the online class and captioning and video elements are available. Uh, secondly, who can provide this assistance? Uh, education department have student support groups, SSGs, and those groups um, have principals, uh, at year level coordinators, uh, and classroom teachers, uh, parents, a number of different people who make up those groups who can consult uh, and talk about how to support the individual and specific needs of the child. That would be a first step to get that done. Sometimes SSGs don't work though, uh, and there's no agreement within that space. So the next step, if there is no agreement there, would be to contact the uh, BEO Herioc complaints. Uh, and they will assist you uh, to use the law specifically uh, and provide advice on what is needed. 
individual advocates can also help if you're not feeling particularly confident yourself. Uh, that means that you can go and get some negotiation support to manage um, and deal with that particular issue. The EO Heriok will listen to your story uh, and they will also listen to the school's uh, side of the story and then provide a mediation service for you to provide some kind of solution. It can be quite complex. What uh, also they need to hear, so remember, uh, there were the three uh, issues we talked about. Uh, there was the impact, the risk, and the solution. If we could have the next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So remember, the third one uh, is what do they need to hear? So we've got the impact, the risk, and then we've got the solution. The impact, you need to demonstrate the impact on the child. The impact is that the child can't learn, they have no access to the classroom environment, they're unable to understand the video content, unable to participate and do any education work. So they're obviously suffering, there's mental health issues that could potentially be involved in stressful situations. Um, it's likely they will be behind in their education. There's also a risk that the school has actually broken the law. So there is a, a, a law that covers all three, that's the uh, Equal Opportunity Act, the Disability Discrimination Act, uh, and also the Disability Standards of Education Act. All of those protect the child's rights uh, to access education fairly. So you could use those three legislative tools to uh, demonstrate that the school has actually broken the law in that particular instance. Uh, again, coming to the solution, you need to be very clear about what you're asking for. Um, you're obviously asking for interpreters in the class for at meetings, you're looking at captions for the video content. Next slide, please. Um, also, who are, you, who are you hearing from? You've got to remember that your story is a very powerful story. It has impact. Uh, it can be very challenging. Uh, sometimes it may not work. Sometimes your BEO Harriot complaint um, is probably the only solution to mediate and find something that works for you. Uh, when you make a complaint, always include it in writing. If you do go to the EO Harriot uh, and you follow the complaint process and you enter mediation, that can be quite useful. There are two different methods or two different ways uh, that you can utilise these five steps, just to clarify. I think currently um, we will have a break. We'll be coming back uh, after the break and we're going to have a question and answer session in relation to self-advocacy and what that looks like. Then we're going to be talking about systemic advocacy in uh, particular. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. It's Catherine here. A few technical issues this evening. Lots of cameras, lots of devices. I'm sorry. But with coronavirus, corona life, everyone's working from home. We're all getting used to this. Also, different. The questions are coming in thick and fast now. Lots of questions about South Africa C. Are you ready? I'm ready to go. Okay, first question. Why is the self-efficacy mill? If I wanted to self-advocate and I wanted also to be an advocate to support me, will they tell me what to do? Do I have to follow everything the advocate says? Can you tell us what you think? So the role of an advocate really um, is to support you to achieve your goals, what it is you want. Uh, they will never actually tell you what to do. Um, it's really about your goals and what you wish to achieve. So if you have a particular issue um, and you want to negotiate something, the advocate will help you work out what your choices are. Um, an advocacy plan could be developed um, and you could also uh, work together and do that together uh, to achieve those goals. Often advocates will help you to navigate uh, your way through the issue and empower you to actually do some self-advocacy work as well. Uh, and also will work with you um, to help you achieve those aims. So the advocate will never ever tell you what to do directly though. You're right. I just wanted to add to that. As individual advocacy officers, advocacy officers here at Deaf Victoria, often clients will come to us and they want to talk about particular issues. Our objective is to empower people. If they register and become a client, and have an ongoing relationship, you always ask the first question, what is it that you want to achieve? I'm not here to direct and tell people what to do. I'm here to support, work with you, and lead you to ensure that your rights are afforded to you, and you get what you want, you're entitled to. Next question, Mel. Earlier on, you talked about self-advocacy having these five brilliant steps, right? That's great. But if I forget the five, what do I do? Is there an easy way to remember them? Um, is there a fridge magnet? How can I carry it around? Because I can't remember these five steps in my head every time something happens. So where do I get to get that information? I really love the idea of a magnet, to be honest. Uh, I think that's a great suggestion for a start. Uh, but I guess there is uh, no resource such as that at this stage, uh, such as a fridge magnet or something free like that, no. Um, I think that um, it's something I should keep in the back of my mind. Or uh, There's got to be a way, I'm sure, or a simple way to remember the five steps. That's something I'll take away with me and um, I'll have a think about. Good idea. Thank you. Uh, maybe something for Deaf Victoria we could uh, maybe have a think about after this workshop. Perhaps you could think about um, how to distribute uh, some kind of resource like that. I think that kind of thing would be a great idea. You're right. That made me think. Yeah, maybe we could a resource uh, we'd like Deaf Victoria to have on. Wanting to support others, we really want to set up maybe a forum to find out what the community wants. Uh, because Deaf Victoria is here to advocate for the community, so we need to be informed by the community. And if it's the fridge magnet, if you want the five Z steps on a fridge magnet, let us know. We'll get on to it. Okay, the next question, Mel. Acts legislation, there's pro protections for, provided to us, but we still face discrimination and barriers in our everyday life as people who are deaf. I'm not a legal expert. How can I remember these five you know, easy questions? Is there some cheat sheet or some tips you can provide to us or direct us to particular pieces of law? Yes, that's actually a, a common problem. Deru has um, worked with many different laws. Uh, and different situations uh, uh, depend or use different forms of legislation. Uh, one of the most common things that we see uh, in the disability sector uh, is the use uh, of the Equal Opportunity Act, the Disability Discrimination Act, and Daru um, has actually developed uh, a resource booklet uh, you can download from our website. Um, it's nice and easy uh, and it explains what's involved in those laws. It's not a complete compendium of the law itself, but it's just something nice and easy that you can follow uh, that talks to the law. 
Daru uh, had that information and also runs a course on our website. It's not a long course, um, but certainly um, it's, it's a basic course in relation to the law. Uh, and it's fully captioned, uh, fully accessible for people, uh, and certainly offers you things to consider. Uh, so I know that UK, you've uh, done the online course yourself uh, on the Diary website, and uh, the online courses are available. They're nice and short. They're not too long. Uh, and there's a lot to learn uh, in relation to the law, just some basic rights um, that you as consumers have. So it's quite valuable. So, right. Uh, I've done few of those courses that I'm happy to share. Um, the Daru's ethics course was amazing and you're right, it was easy to follow, it wasn't heavy, hard going, it was easy, light, clear, and at the end of it I felt good I actually had learned something. Okay, last question for this Q&A session, actually we've got two more. Uh, so the last two questions are, there's a variety of advocates and advocacy types and last night in our human rights workshop talked about lots of different pieces of legislation and rights and provisions there to protect us. And why are these so important and unique? Like why would you want to have an advocate with you, have that conversation? With, how do I know who's available? Because my situation is unique. Does Daru have a list of you know, advocates from those 24 member organizations? Where do we find advocates? So the website, Daru's website, uh, has an online directory. Uh, that has um, a comprehensive uh, list uh, of all 24 organisations in Victoria and also Australia-wide. Um, there's also uh, information or descriptions about what disability areas uh, they cover. Some um, advocate organisations, um, such as Deaf Victoria, for example, you look after Victoria uh, and deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, other advocate organisations uh, are only in uh, looking after local government areas with specific disabilities. So, um, AB, uh, acquired brain injuries, for example, um, and other different types of disabilities, each one is quite unique. So, for deaf people, uh, who but you, you don't have to go to Deaf Victoria as such. There are other advocacy organisations out there um, who also um, have their own unique knowledge areas as well. Uh, so, and there are other agencies as well, specialist agencies uh, to provide assistance also. Our um, website has that directory that will explain um, and provide information on each of the different areas that they uh, look after. And it's worthwhile jumping on and having a bit of a look. Um, it's always key to know what your options are in life, and fortunately here we have lots of options when it comes to advocates. So if someone came to Deaf Victoria, we'd make that time, let them know the advocacy service that we can provide to them. So for example, a deaf person approached us and wanted a particular type of support, and that was a specific support about another disability type or legislation. We could call in other advocates and other organisations to work with us to provide the best information advice to empower different and hard people in Victoria. Now the last question now before we move on to the, to the main part of your presentation. The question is, okay, so I've tried advocacy. I'm not getting any response. No one's listening to me. That's popping me off. What do I do? What, what do I do next? From the deaf Victoria point of view, I agree. Unfortunately, uh, the amount of funding that advocacy receives is low, so you could be waiting for some time and may not get an immediate response. So the number one tip that I'm going to give to all of you and I'll share with you, keep this in your back pocket, is if you approach an advocate, flag the issue with them, if you don't have a, a response within a reasonable period of time, follow up. If you're not happy, you're not getting any response at all, find another advocate or advocacy organisation. Like Mel said, there are 24 different advocacy organisations, part of Daru here in Victoria. Remember, follow up perhaps a week later if you haven't received a response by Mel, because there's not a lot of funding for advocacy. So yes. What else could people do? Uh, yes, also, uh, there's another role that Daru has. It's very similar to being, I guess, a middleman. Um, between the state government and the disability advocacy organisations. So we can mediate between the two, provide information uh, on projects and things like that. One of the big issues uh, currently 
uh, and which is unfortunate, is advocacy organisations uh, are on a waiting list that's quite extensive at the moment. Uh, there are so many people who are on that waiting list waiting for advocacy support, uh, specifically for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, and where applications perhaps have failed, um, they've had problems accessing the scheme um, and receiving support from the NDIS. So it's quite extensive um, and a lot of people out there who are waiting and there just aren't enough advocates uh, to help everybody. Currently, um, that, you know, that is a big problem area. Um, and I guess in, in the advocacy support, support area, it's difficult for uh, people and often people will contact uh, an organisation and they're told that they're able to assist and that can happen a number of times and then they're placed onto a waiting list. Um, the best way um, is to uh, really try and work through that situation yourself, uh, doing some self-advocacy. Um, you know, if you really uh, can, try to work your way through and if you find you're stuck um, at a particular point, um, you can get some assistance, but, you know, certainly doing the best you can within that scenario is, is beneficial. So right. It can be a very frustrating time. You're dealing with an issue and you want a solution and it's nothing, nothing's happening, nothing's changing, nothing's forthcoming. So you go to yes. other advocacy organisations. If you're not satisfied, can you provide feedback to the organisation saying, look, hey, I've been waiting for a few days, I'm waiting for a week here. Is there anything that you can tell me that I can do myself while I wait for the official appointment, the official advocate to start working with me? Is there something you can do to empower me, enable me? You're right. So we know that you're going to go into more detail uh, about the content of a complaint. So now we finish the Q&A, we'll hand back over to Mel. Uh, we've got another Q&A session later on during the presentation. Over to you, Mel. Great. Thank you, Kate. Okay, uh, so we'll now move on to systemic advocacy. And talking about self-advocacy uh, and how to resolve perhaps our own issues uh, up to this point, but systemic advocacy um, is a bit different. So like I said before, systemic advocacy um, is a completely different process. Uh, it's not about asking those five questions that we've discussed already. It's quite different uh, because that's actually uh, what we discussed previously is about you. This can affect everybody. So when we perhaps try to change law or a policy, often a large issue uh, is actually uh, you know, getting that change to happen. Uh, it can be a big problem. Uh, sometimes it appears to be too big. The solution is just too hard uh, when you first start and kick that off. So the first step is to actually work out what it is you're trying to achieve uh, and then making your way from there. So getting a, an idea of the big picture, uh, what that big problem is, and then the mapping path. that out, uh, that pathway to how you can actually then achieve that uh, and what success ultimately looks like for you. So once you've actually worked that pathway out, you can then backtrack and start the first step, which is looking at your big problem and breaking that down into smaller problems or bite-sized problems and working out what steps you need to achieve to uh, resolve those small problems, which leads obviously to the resolution of the big problem. Uh, next, um, we need to uh, show um, how we use systemic advocacy. If we could move to the next slide, that would be great. So it's very small writing, I do apologise, but I will um, take you through the slide anyway. Uh, again, um, this is just an example. Uh, there are, uh, oh, this, is, uh, this process is obviously a lot more complex than this, but certainly this is um, a map, if you like, and a demonstration of how to plan. So you've got your big problem. Uh, there is a, a new policy that says that all Victorians must now wear masks due to coronavirus. Deaf and hard of hearing people find communication with masks, with masks on very stressful. So before we work out how we're going to change that, we need to work out <clears throat> what it is we want to achieve, looking at that pathway, uh, and having a look at our goals uh, and ensuring that we have uh, the end goal, which is smooth communication processes for deaf and hard of hearing people through the coronavirus times. So that's actually what we want to achieve. So that's the, the big impact, is that there are many people um, uh, 
where we don't have an easy solution because, you know, the legislation or policy is that people must wear a mask, so that makes it difficult. What we'd like to achieve um, is smooth communication for hard of hearing and deaf people through the coronavirus situation. The second step um, is to then put the handbrake on, go back and break that problem down into smaller bite-sized pieces or problems. So there are three uh, small uh, problems that we've identified here. Hard of hearing people uh, have a barrier to lip reading, uh, doctors and the like, professionals with masks on. Signing deaf people's communication is also affected um, because interpreters are required to wear a mask. And deaf and hard of hearing people uh, have mental health uh, problems as a consequence. So those uh, are small three problems that we've been able to distill from that larger problem. So thinking about the mask law uh, and systemic advocacy, um, we um, have broken that down into those th small three steps and we can then look at resolutions for each of those smaller steps, uh, which will help us then find the solutions. Uh, some solutions might be, for example, um, for hard of hearing people who lip read, uh, it could be the hospital doctors are uh, provided with uh, different options. Uh, they could wear clear masks, uh, they could uh, use an app, they could use uh, note taking, uh, there could be announcements to the community, they could take their masks off for specific communication moments and then place them back on. Secondly, for interpreters, uh, Auslan interpreters, you could provide clear masks to that community so that communication access uh, occurs. And for deaf people's mental health, uh, you could also let the community know, um, you know that we need to be kind and sympathetic uh, and empathetic to the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, mental health services, uh, phone services, um, have um, online chat. You could uh, increase those. Uh, and you could provide access to interpreters with captioning, those kind of things. So they're the little things that you could work out. You achieve those smaller goals, which then makes it easy to develop and achieve that large goal and provides smooth and safe communication for deaf and hard of hearing people through the coronavirus situation. Please remember with systemic advocacy um, that the big problem and the pathway then to working out the goal achievement um, requires the breaking down of the problem into smaller bite-sized pieces uh, and then smaller solutions that work together to help you achieve that large goal. Uh, and that there in a nutshell is systemic advocacy. Um, in real life, it obviously would take uh, quite a significant period of time. Uh, you've got organisations that would have an enormous amount of work to do in the background. But certainly um, it's a good way for planning if you're going to tackle systemic advocacy. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, so we come now to the end of my presentation. Uh, there's a few things I guess I would like all of you to take away tonight from the workshop. Um, firstly, um, it's okay to complain. Uh, if you uh, never complain, uh, then you never make a change. Remember to always be very clear and identify the problem. Um, and also demonstrate the impact, provide a solution. Um, it's particularly important that you do this. Next slide, please. Thank you. It's always um, worthwhile researching also um, where to complain. So I know a lot of people have the habit of um, putting complaints social media. In, on social media, but that may not be the best avenue. Um, so you can perhaps maybe head to Deaf Victoria for advice and ask them for a specific and best place space to, uh, to complain. Uh, systemic advocacy um, uh, has been around for a long time. There are a lot of people uh, who, uh, first of all, identify allies, uh, specific uh, advocacy groups uh, such as Deaf Victoria, um, Deaf Australia, Deaf Australia um, who have um, a good understanding uh, and are very powerful, a good understanding of the deaf community and its issues and are powerful. Um, just remember you're not alone. Um, if you are struggling uh, with uh, self-advocacy, uh, remember that Deaf Victoria is, is there to help um, and you know they're there for you to contact and to use it and use it often. Thank you so much for listening this evening. Um, I hope it has helped you in some way.
Sorry, Mel, but it was great. Great presentation, really thoughtful content. Something about individual advocacy as opposed to systemic advocacy. There's clear differences. The recurring themes are happening here and questions about the difference between the two. And I think the deaf community has learned a lot more tonight about systemic advocacy. We've got a few questions from the community. And there's some deaf people that would like to ask their question on Auslan. So I'll just see if the team's ready to spot behind our community members who are going to ask questions. Are we ready to turn the spotlight on? We've got some technical issues here, Mel, so just bear with us. It's coronavirus time, right? Can you ready? It's so true. Sure, take it away. Okay, I'm watching the Facebook feed and the community, and there's a lot happening out there. They're asking questions of you, Mel, in terms of the areas that you work in. Uh, can you tell us a little more about advocacy in those spaces? Uh, is it how I work in the advocacy area? Yep. Sorry, my window's got a bit uh, misplaced, but certainly how I work or how I came to work in, in advocacy, is that right? Oh, yeah, that's, that's the question. That's a good question, actually. Uh, there's no, I guess, formal qualification as such um, to become an advocate. Um, there's no uh, TAFE course, for example. There's nothing that you can do as such to gain an official qualification uh, to be an advocate. Um, for, for many different reasons, I, I probably don't have time to go into this evening or won't go into. Um, but if you would like to become an advocate, um, then basically you need to know how to complain and complain well. Um, so it, it's helpful to know um, how to uh, write policy, um, how to uh, research law, how to uh, gain an understanding. Well, certainly you don't know, need to know everything about law, but you need to know where to find the right law that's applicable for that particular issue. Um, you could have issues within the employment area, uh, for an example, and you need to learn how to navigate the right law uh, and know what right law applies for that particular situation. So you can navigate your way through the system. Um, I think that's probably the best way I, I could answer that question. Certainly training for advocates, uh, Daru, um, we certainly uh, have some on-the-job training, yeah. Thanks, Bob. I think we're ready now to go back to Kate and then spotlight our first person who's going to ask a question. Let's see if I can get this to work. Hi, everyone. Okay. Community member Hadley Johnson has a question for you. Hadley, over to you. Okay, here I am. Hi. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. I really enjoyed your presentation, um, Melissa. The community has a lot of anger, and we want responses, and we want them now. I know it's hard. Deaf Victoria, pay respect to them. And I watched Philip Waters last night. Really appreciate the presentation. I've heard what you got to say tonight from Daru. I know you need advocacy for different reasons. Do you know what? Sometimes I get tired of self-advocating. I want to bring in other advocates to help support me. And they say, I don't have an energy for that, or I'd rather advocate for that issue. So my question to you, for you is this. Many of us are very positive, um, passionate about the healthcare system. You know, the healthcare system, particularly in hospitals, is broken down. So does that mean I have to research the relevant piece of legislation to get access, to get advocacy, to get things happen right that I need in the healthcare system? So the healthcare system is so broken, you know, and we need to have more responsive services when it comes to laws and interpreters. Um, we also need to have healthcare professionals that are deaf aware, that have deaf awareness training, that understand about different types of communication modes for deaf and hard of hearing people. What's your advice? How can we um, how can we break through the healthcare system, particularly in public hospitals, private hospitals as well, so that any deaf person can present at a hospital and have to go through major issues just to get the treatment. Oh, you're deaf and you've got to organise an interpreter. And I've got to complain about that. Meanwhile, I've got a health issue. 
male, I can't wait a, a month, six months. I want to walk in off the street like anyone else that does to a public hospital to receive a service. I'm like everyone else. What, what can I do? I really appreciate your response. Any thoughts? Thank you very much, Hadley. Um, actually, um, hospital uh, interpreting uh, is one of my uh, passions as well. Um, back when I was working uh, at Deaf Victoria, uh, for a long time, it was a passion. And like I said, uh, systemic advocacy um, has been around for a significant amount of time and uh, hasn't been around for a, a long time. It has been around for many years um, and has an impact uh, and it takes quite some time to have an impact on the system. Um, I think the problem with hospitals is the policy changes uh, and also the law changes as well. And obviously you have the right to an interpreter within the hospital. Uh, the policies are all there. Uh, and you actually also um, have a right to choose which interpreter organisation you use to then select your interpreter to attend hospital. So you have options for many choices and the policies are very clear about that. It's just when those policies hit the ground uh, and are being used by nurses and doctors without training, uh, there is a disconnect between what the policy says and what actually occurs in practice. Um, so there is a failure there, a systemic failure, uh, where uh, advocates actually, actually have changed the policy. Um, and it's been, it's been going on for quite some time where the organisation, the hospital themselves, actually need to commit to making sure that the policies are clear and disseminated clearly down through the hospital hierarchy down to the nurses and the doctors who work on the ground. Um, so they have an understanding of the policies, are able to follow the policies. Um, and unfortunately, um, in real life, we know this doesn't always happen. Um, if you go to a hospital, um, they sometimes will not provide you with an interpreter and that obviously is a breach of your rights. Um, so you can then say, look, uh, there is a policy there um, and I would like you to follow it, but that's not always easy and sometimes you don't win that. So if you go to a hospital, um, you want to have an interpreter, it can be frustrating. Um, how to fix it um, is difficult. Um, we need to continue the advocacy fight um, in relation to the health system um, and make changes. Uh, and, and make them understand and value the rights of deaf people more, I think, ultimately. Thanks for that response, Mel. I just want to um, chime in here. So Deaf Victoria has been working, doing a lot of work on access to our hospitals. As you mentioned earlier, you were the previous manager here. Deaf Victoria, you wrote um, a brilliant report about Auslan interpreter provision in the hospitals throughout the state of Victoria. The report was written in 2014, right, Mel? Why, some time ago, yes. Yeah, it goes way back a few years now. So there's a lot of work being done with that. The implementation went through a lot of different organisations, we worked with the Equal Opportunity in the Rights Commission here in Victoria, and as Philip Water said last night, you know, the Science of Health Project, that's another a piece of work that has been completed. So having said that, uh, we've, we've worked on that report, we've created a lot of resources, we have a, we're working on a project right now of training staff in hospitals about how to uh, work to ensure that hospitals are accessible to deaf people and their services. And there's a lot of connections there. You think about all the different different we actually have a project right now, which is a health advocacy project, which is funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, a future advocacy grant that Deaf Victoria was successful in receiving. And it's a systemic advocacy piece of work. And this links in beautifully, Mel, with the report that Deaf Victoria that you managed and wrote in 2014. Um, do you know that work there is not complete? That is still an ongoing piece of work. We never stop advocating. Hospitals all around Victoria have knowledge at one point in time, have the skills, they've implemented the policy, that's key, like you said earlier on, the earlier, easy, key part is changing the policy, it's implementation. So when a deaf person at any, at any time in any hospital presents, 
the staff know what to do. They're not in a panic, but the deaf person walks through the door thinking, oh, what do I do with this deaf person? Um, our health is like everyone else's health. It's important. And we want to make these changes for the community in terms of access, improving advocacy, improving access, and we're making resources for hospital staff. And they can continually churn and change over. So it's not easy to navigate you know, the public health system. It's a, a, a huge workforce. We have to train. Uh, particularly in the area of the emergency department, birthing, the people who are impacting patients, which is so we're focused on these three particular areas to try and make tangible change um, and improve the quality of access uh, to deaf people and health services. Now, we've got lots of time. Uh, Mel finished early, so I'll fire away some more questions, Mel. Well, first of all, I'm proud to say that's still continuing. And it's difficult. Um, it's not just a one-off solution. There's a, a, a lot of um, systems like the health system. Um, policies are great, but policies being used on the ground, unfortunately, as I said, there's that disconnect. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've got that high-level policy, which is brilliant. It's great. But then it's kind of making its way down to the ground. That's right. It's not yeah, that's the filter through the organisation to all the different levels. Mm. Exactly right. I agree. It's a great policy has to be implemented throughout the organisation. So our objective here is to make sure that the health system here in Victoria is easier for deaf and hard of hearing people to access like it is for anyone else. We're just like everyone else. You know, we have needs, we want to have access to health care at any point in time. And it's hard to be able to manage that yourself and have to advocate at the same time for a basic entitlement that everyone else is receiving. We have a right to receive the same access to that healthcare service. Now, just looking for any other questions coming through from anyone. Let me just see if we have any questions from the community. I can't see any questions going through other devices. And any screens are that may mean it's time to wrap up, Bill. Okay. So, if there are no further questions, we will wrap it up early tonight. Um, what to say? Well, yet again, you've shared a lot of information about individual advocacy and systemic advocacy, uh, which was wonderful. Um, I hope everyone that's tuned in tonight, that's watched this presentation, has learned something about individual advocacy and systemic advocacy. Um, think about it a little more. Talk to your friends and family. Please contact us here at Victoria. We just, I think, we have received a question from somewhere. Where is it from? I'm going to just spotlight Kate now. Let me just take care of that. Okay, can everyone see me now? Yeah, we just received a question. And it's with regard to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Let me just see, I'll just change the view of my camera. Okay, that's better. Can you see me now? So Mel, Mel did speak earlier on. You can have you know, this great new shiny thing called the National Disability Insurance Scheme, but you know, all that information doesn't filter through the workforce, all the different levels, and we're coming up against frequent questions and issues. Mel, what do we do when we come up against these issues in the so common the question themes, is common themes about barriers, you know, people receiving plans and they're not what they expect. What what can we do? Well many advocates actually tell me that often uh, when people I guess sorry, just let me fix up my screen just a moment. That's better. So often um, advocates tell me that Clients provide information about what their needs are to NDIS and somehow something happens within the system but that message does not make its way through and they get a plan that doesn't really adequately meet their needs and it's very medically based as well. Um, That's true. I guess the idea was around choice and control and 
I think that there is uh, a lot of, well, within the NGIS, um, there really um, is not much choice, ultimately, and, and perhaps not much control uh, around what happens. So choice and control um, is a little bit of a misnomer, to be honest, uh, to show you the truth. And I think choice and control perhaps is not really there as, as we would like to think. Um, I think the if you look at the impact uh, of disability in your life, uh, that's one thing, but, but disability is only a small part of your life. And I guess possible, um, it's good to kind of talk about what your whole life looks like and have a vision of NDIS. It doesn't really translate though, unfortunately, to a person's whole of life, which is sad because the vision's great, but it doesn't practically kind of result in anything of value. And uh, independent assessments, you might have seen that's coming up soon, um, independent assessments, uh, soon all participants. Um, will uh, be independently assessed uh, and uh, by a person who potentially doesn't even know um, who they are, they've never met before. Um, and uh, there is potential there for that to be difficult. How um, can they adequately assess you if they've never met you before? Uh, maybe they don't know, uh, you know your type of disability particularly well. So it's things like that that really aren't meeting the goal or the vision of what the organisation originally was intended to be. Uh, I just want to build upon that. Uh, I heard about the independent assessment. Uh, deaf people are fucked up by the NDIS. And I know I met one of the people at the LAC. We had a good conversation. You know, the, it was the first time they met a deaf person. And lots of deaf people have the same experience. They report back for the first time. Being in LAC, exactly. it's the first time the LAC is seeing a deaf person, and they know nothing about deaf lived life, or what it is um, that we need in terms of visual alerts and alarms for our front door. And when they receive the plan, to their shock, they find it doesn't really address what their needs are, let alone choice control. So if you receive a great plan, that's your fortune, but if not, it can request for review right and then you have a conversation with the LAC and that's where you can bring in Fair Victoria or another advocate to assist you to ensure you get the plan that you're entitled to that meets your needs and empowers and enables you. Then it goes back to that first initial conversation with the LAC, making sure you're clear, articulate and you advocate for what you want. It's an opportunity there for you really to make your case strong and clear. What do you think, Mel? You can actually get advocacy support as well um, because there's no additional funding for advocates to do their work. So if every person um, wanted some kind of support um, within the NDIS plan for advocacy, there just wouldn't be enough advocates around to actually do the work. And that's actually part of the problem as well. Um, right. One thing uh, which is unfortunate, one unfortunate thing about the NDIS is that when you uh, do your first plan, uh, it's almost like uh, you need to know how to fight, uh, you know, what wording needs to be included and what particular order uh, when you're having that planning meeting. It's, you almost need to know how to argue uh, for what your needs are in the correct way. Um, it's almost like you need to go in there and say, look, I need these items, these things. Um, and you need to do it in the right way. And if you don't, then you have the risk of having a plan that's, that doesn't meet your needs. Um, I think that's what the, the, the original vision for the NDIS was. It really was about personal choice. It was about um, leading a full life um, and actually getting what I need. Uh, and in living that ordinary life. But I think um, having to prove and fight for what I need to live an ordinary life, I think has been real a real failure of the NDIS, and that's a systemic problem again. Uh, and yeah, it needs to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you.
that's sort of true. It's sort of frustrating that there's no funding for advocates that presents a different challenge. But whether it's the NDIS or the hospital setting, if I do present at a hospital, I'm just going to the hospital, okay? You know the hospitals take appointments from 9 to 5, but people have lives and things happen outside of 9 to 5. So what happens if I present at the hospital out of business hours? How can I advocate? How can I get an interpreter that's not been presented to me? Or my request is required. What can I do? Would you have the right to ask for an interpreter after hours? Um, I just have to wait for spotlight email. I know I can see, but we've got technology. Turn the camera around to light you up, Mel. Okay. So certainly you have the right to ask for an interpreter. Uh, and I guess that's the process uh, where the hospitals uh, have a number to arrange uh, for an interpreter, an Aussie interpreter. Uh, will they actually do that? That's the question. Uh, it rarely happens, we know that. But certainly you do have the right to ask uh, and also you know, speak to the hospital about what that looks like. Okay, I'll just wait for the spotlight to come back to me, Mel. Still waiting for the big spotlight to turn around. I think it's back to me now, Mel. Okay, well, you know, advocacy is such a fascinating area. Deaf people in their everyday life have to advocate for things that everyone else just receives and takes for granted. So if I want more training, or well, where can I get some training? Well, you've been doing this for a long time, many years of advocacy. Have you had to undertake any particular training? Well, what more training is available for people in the sector? Um, what more can people do? So I've been an advocate for a long time, so long I can't remember, but really my background... So long from a ...social worker. Uh, and that's how I actually learned how to write uh, policy uh, and work through that. and. Uh, writing submissions, for example. Oh, sorry. Can, uh, I think we're a bit... We have a few technical issues again. Yeah, I understand. The view on the screen changes. Let's give you a moment to configure your screen. I hope everyone around can see us okay. Okay, so unfortunately my screen uh, moved around. But anyway... Um, so... Policy and training, of course, um, and I started working uh, at Deaf Victoria, one-on-one uh, -on -one with clients, um, with no formal qualification in advocacy. There, there is no such thing, um, but most of it was around professional development, learning on the job, law, learning about uh, different laws, uh, and also different human rights as well, the complaint processes, different complaint processes. Um, and I guess um, that doing that kind of work consistently um, really kind of enabled me to become an advocate, and that's really how that happened. Right, so let's wait for the spotlight to turn around to me. Okay, spotlight on me. You're right, Mel. Like I said earlier on, advocacy, okay, receives very little funding. So training qualifications are rare. I think we need more forums like tonight to inform the community, to provide information to the community, and therefore empower the community. But I believe we've got one more question. I'm going to hand over to a community member who wants to ask that question of our friend. So we're going to spotlight them. Are you ready for your next question, Mel? Let's see if our technology is going to work for us. Just thank you for your patience. Michael Parrymore, can we turn your camera on now? Okay, the spotlight's on you, Michael. Hi there, Mel. Okay, good presentation. I enjoyed that. Um, I enjoyed the Q&A session so far. I want to talk about the NDS for a moment. Um, deaf people, they're not receiving the supports they need. When the NDS was initially planned, what they envisaged was 
something brilliant on paper, but it's not being delivered in practice. Think about the LAC, be the planner, what type of knowledge do they have? They need to have certain knowledge to be able to write the best possible plan with the NDS participant. So you need to work with the LAC planner to say what supports you need, and importantly, like you said, argue your case as to why. And it's all about life goals. You need to have goals. That's how the plans are built. And we also have to ensure that the workforce is better supported to write the plans that deaf people want. Thanks, Michael. You know, the NDS has been rolled out, it's now fully rolled out in Australia. And the deaf community, I know who have applied for NDS plans, have found it to be overwhelming. The system itself is still being built. We're still trying to work it out with the Australian government. But it's an opportunity for deaf individuals and the deaf community if they're facing barriers to share this information to a deaf, with Deaf Victoria. We'd really value you sharing your anecdotes, you know, your trials and tribulations. We receive a small amount of funding and we want to support the community. And we're also looking for issues that we can work together with the community and, and advocate to the government and set up projects that target specific issues which are of mutual benefit to everyone in the community. Mel, I think you've got a comment. We'll just turn the spotlight on you. Good day, Michael Paramore. I do have something to add, um, and that is that the role of the advocate is really to be involved when something goes wrong. Uh, it's not, I guess, um, when the planning uh, is happening. It's when something goes wrong. So the advocate really uh, should get involved if uh, perhaps there's an appeal or a review decision uh, uh, for that person with disability. If they themselves perhaps are struggling and they're not sure exactly what to do, if they're not confident perhaps, um, then the advocate can step in and assist. Unfortunately, um, there are not many deaf as, as such, but we've seen it with other disabilities um, where often uh, people with disabilities don't have uh, anyone else in their life who knows them personally, who knows them well, to provide that assistance. So the advocate really becomes a, a personal a support person also to try and work out and get a good plan. So it's not really the role of the advocate, you're right. Uh, the role of the LAC, uh, the, the support coordination or coordinators, um, they're obviously people who can help uh, to develop uh, their skills uh, for those plans, uh, but the technical role of the advocate is to get involved when something has gone wrong. Um, but often, in real life, it can of course be a bit more complex than that. Thanks, Mel. Good question, Michael. Advocacy, you know, in the NDS, there's new, it's a lot of teething problems, we're still trying to work out the best way forward. Here we've got another question for you, Mel. And this is um, from another community member who was saying, I'm deaf and blind. Is it better for me to contact Deaf Blind Victoria or Deaf Victoria or go to Daru when I need some advocacy and some support? Mel, would you like to answer that question? Yes, absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. Um, to be honest, it's your choice. Daru um, does not advocate for individual clients. So Daru's role um, is to be a support for disability advocates to receive training uh, needs uh, for advocates as such. Um, so we're not there to support individual clients, so that's one thing. Um, deaf Victoria supports deaf people, uh, deaf and blind people also, hard of hearing people. Um, and deaf and blind Victoria um, also has self-advocacy groups, which means that deaf and blind people can join groups with other deaf and blind people and learn self-advocacy, do some research, work together, and understand how that works within a self-advocacy group. So it's a little bit different. Um, uh, if, and if you want something like personal advocacy, you can contact Deaf Victoria. Um, there are other organisations, as I said before, that could assist. Um, and uh, you can contact Deaf Victoria. You can contact Deaf Blind Victoria if you would like to. Uh, and you could learn to self-advocate uh, and then contact um, other deaf blind people too. Just wait for a minute. Spotlight is back on me, Mel. I think we've got one more question.
question. I want to ensure that we've got, I've got this right. Okay. The question is, okay, I understand there are different types of approaches to advocacy, individual advocacy, systemic advocacy. What about the community? There's an issue recently that blew up in the community, and, like, and Black Lives Matter, those community-wide issues, or you know, Indigenous people and Indigenous lives matter, those Black Lives Matter. Um, that's systemic advocacy, right? Or is it individual advocacy? But how do you know? Is it one or the other, or is it both? Are they mutually exclusive? Can you tell us more about the Black Lives Matter and how that fits in the advocacy process? So the Black Lives Matter protests, those ones uh, are campaigns, uh, if you like, uh, very similar to systemic advocacy, um, but I guess they're, they're more trying to demonstrate or, or to raise awareness of a particular issue. That campaign, that's probably the, the wrong sign for that, but that campaign, um, I think it really uh, depends first on, on what the objectives are uh, of the campaign. Um, it can be really hard uh, to work out, if you look at the media, what the solution is and what the outcomes might be. So systemic advocacy um, is, though, on the other hand, quite clear and structured uh, around what the aims and the goals are. Black Lives Matter uh, within the media, you can see a lot of campaigning, uh, a lot of certainly raising awareness of Black Lives Matter. But what we don't see um, is the, I guess, clear outcome of what that campaign is after. Um, George. There was the George Floyd who died over in the USA. Um, that was police brutality, certainly. But what outcome were they asking for in particular? Um, you can see that there is a distinction between um, systemic advocacy and a campaign as such. Does that answer that question? Thank you, Mel. It does answer the question. And we're still receiving questions from the community now. Now, someone just sent in a, a comment or a question. It relates to a hospital. I'll share this with you now. now. This is an ongoing issue for the deaf community and hospitals. There's constant lack of access. It's not new. It's been around forever in a day. How can we improve this situation in 2020, Mel? It just seems to happen time and time again to all of us, so many of us. It's in different situations. You, know, you try and escalate the issue. You're thinking, what are the solutions? Do hospital staff the workforce in deaf awareness training program regularly? Well, I can answer that question in part. Um, if it's individual advocacy, when we meet individuals, talk to individual clients, deal with individual issues, empower them. Then systemic advocacy, we have a project coordinator, Sherry Beaver, who you met this evening. Sherry spoke a little earlier this evening about this particular project. Okay, and this project has a clear focus and it's for the deaf and hard of hearing community. So if you're receiving um, services that you're having access issues regarding provision of interpreters or some other communication issue with the hospital, please share that with us. We're here to work with you. Are there any other questions? I believe we have one more, is that right? Okay, it, it relates to the NDS again, Mel. Uh, it seems to be you know, the ongoing hot topic. Now, in the AIS and the LAC or the planners, you meet them, you have the conversation with them, the planning meeting. You say, okay, these are my goals. They you know nothing about deafness. You have to educate them. They need deaf awareness training. So you need to educate them about who you are, what your needs are. They don't get it. You advocate for what you want. You're not getting the plan that you want. You don't have choice control. So the question for you, Mel, is you said earlier on, you bring an advocate when things go wrong. What if you don't want things to go wrong? Can you be proactive? Okay. Can the advocate be proactive? We don't want to bring in an advocate when things go wrong. We don't want things to go wrong in the first place. What can you do there? 
so the first question I think was about NGIS. Um, Sorry, it was a long question. I just taken. I did uh, throw a lot of information out to you there. I think there were two. Yes, it was around LACs not being aware of deafness. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Access well, barriers at the LAC. Unfortunately, when the National Disability Insurance Scheme kicked off, um, they rapidly deployed many, many staff, uh, and particularly in the uh, local area coordinated roles. And I think you know they had perhaps a week's worth of training where they had to take on board, you know, quite complex uh, elements. And I think really by the time that people had taken them on board uh, about different disabilities. Uh, you know, unfortunately, they couldn't learn about every disability. That was not possible. So I guess I don't really have an answer to resolve that issue. I think that advocacy, uh, unfortunately, um, within those roles, people don't really understand disability as such. I think that they will learn more about disability, and that's probably an answer. In relation to being proactive with advocacy, um, really, advocacy only gets involved when something happens um, that is not right. So being proactive, I guess, is more around uh, being aware um, about different activities, things you can do. Uh, for example, um, I'm just trying to think of a particular example. Um, masks could be one example. Uh, the wearing of masks, systemic advocacy in relation to that, the example I gave you earlier. So if you um, perhaps said, you know, we're all going to be wearing masks, masks next week, you could be proactive uh, and you could say, look, just to let you know straight away, masks, masks do not work particularly well for deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, you know, you need to find a solution um, for that particular uh, issue. And I think advocacy is more of a uh, reactive rather than proactive um, tool in that space. Right. Okay. Thanks, Mel. I don't think we have any other questions, right? Let's check all the devices, the different screens, platforms. No further questions, Mel. Well, once again, great presentation. Very informative. We learned a lot about advocacy. Thank you, Mel. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight on this Tuesday night to learn more about individual advocacy and systemic advocacy. Uh, we hope that you can apply this into your lives today and into the future. Now, I'm wrapping up, I'll just ask a few other people to turn their uh, cameras on. I'll ask Paula now to give you a brief rundown on the new project that she's doing. Over to you, Paula. Over to you, Paula. Spotlight's on you. You're good to go. So we have a new um, project team that we've established that's composed of me, uh, Debbie uh, Kerwell, uh, and also uh, Shirley. Uh, so Def the Deaf Victoria team uh, is involved in developing more resources because we know uh, that there are many gaps that need to be filled in relation to uh, information, access, advocacy, uh, providing people with more confidence and the capacity to step forward. Uh, we know that's important in everybody's lives. Uh, so there are resources that we're going to be developing and disseminating in a few weeks. Um, we've actually asked uh, community groups to provide feedback uh, about what the gaps are, any ideas, novel ideas they might have. Uh, we've got some ideas, or I've certainly gained some ideas from this evening's discussion. Uh, and we're looking uh, at developing those. Uh, hopefully they'll be done in about three weeks' time, uh, and then they'll be launched. They'll be launched on Facebook and on Zoom, so there'll be more information coming this week. Um, any ideas you have? Uh, would be great, uh, and I hope that it provides you with some confidence and some assistance moving forward with your advocacy work uh, and getting some assistance there. Great, thanks, Paula. That's exciting to hear about this new project, creating resources, including a fridge magnet. Who knows? All right, thank you, everyone. So, moving on now, 
uh, I'd like to extend a word of thanks to the Deaf Victoria team for um, the project and the community workshop tonight. Thanks, thank Melissa Hale, our presenter, uh, knowledgeable expert on all things efficacy, individual and systemic. Now, the work that you've done for many years, Mel, um, really precedes you. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing information with us. Um, it goes back you know, to the Deaf Victoria days here, and now at Daru, you've been a wonderful advocate for the many years. So I'd like to express our thank yous to the Deaf Victoria team, Maxine, Kate, Sarah, tonight. Um, without all of them working behind the scenes, you know, uh, I don't know what would have happened. This certainly would have happened tonight. I'd like to thank our interpreters and our captioner as well this evening, and all of you, the community. I'd also like to thank the NDA for uh, funding this project, providing information on the Just Capacity uh, Fund. Uh, this is vital for our deaf and hard of hearing community here in Victoria, these community workshops. We will be sharing a questionnaire with you, and we'd like you to complete that via Facebook or email. Uh, we really would like to hear what you have to say. Um, this healthcare project in particular relies upon your with that, uh, if you have any further questions or you require support from Deaf Victoria, please feel free to email us at info at deafvictoria.org.au. Uh, if you require any type of support, please don't hesitate. We're here to provide support to you and advocate with and for you. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, this evening. And lastly, I'm sure you'd like to see the, the team at what they look like. So I'll ask everyone now to turn on their cameras. Join me. You can turn your cameras on. And I'll say thank you to everyone. This is the team, including our interpreters, our captioner. Thank you, everyone. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great teamwork. Teamwork makes it happen. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy your evening.